Now we're going to review a few of the commands that we've been running and then look at conceptually how they interact with Docker. So one of the common commands that we use is docker run. And what this does is tells Docker we're going, or tells Linux we're going to execute a program called Docker. This next one tells it that we're going to run an image. So it tells Docker we're going to run an image. This is a parameter into the Docker command. Then we follow that with a second parameter, which is for the image name. And then Docker goes into this workflow. So it looks a little something like this. It searches locally for an image called Hello World. So it looks on our local install of Linux. Then if it's not found, it goes out to the Docker hub on the web and looks for that particular one. Now we didn't actually have one called Hello World. We had one called Docker slash Hello World because there are multiple Hello Worlds. Remember when we looked on line in the Docker hub, we saw a bunch of others that people were creating. So we had to specify particularly which one we wanted and that was done with Docker slash Hello World. So if it finds it, it pulls it down to our local installation of Linux. Then it extracts that image and at that point it can spin it up and that environment is running. So however it's configured, then that's what we're also going to have on our machine. So someone's configured that particular instance some way. They've got programs on it. They've got those programs maybe configured in a particular way of how they're going to run. And there could be other things going on in the environment that they've configured. So that's what we're going to see the end result of when the image runs. And when it runs, it creates the container. So this is one of the big pieces of the Docker uh, mythology of how it does things with containers. You've got this very contained environment that's running and it doesn't require anything else from the outside world. It's kind of like its own little computer in Linux. It doesn't need drivers and other things. Docker provides it with an infrastructure, the file system for networking. Those pieces are there as well for the container. And we can run multiple containers from the same image. So now let's look at a mapping of this. So we start off with this command, docker run, whatever the image name is. In this case, it's my image. So here's the container, it spins up. Now, this container has inside of it, like I was saying earlier, this infrastructure provided. So it will have an OS, and then there's programs that someone has created in the container. So in this case, there's some kind of web server. It could be an Nginx web server, whatever it might be. Then someone on the outside, just on the web in their browser, has, hits our web server. So they type in a domain name, then that hits our web server. And behind the scenes, it might we might mask it with something like this. So we've got our website name, there's a port number, and then the information gets sent over to the user. And if we've done everything right, this is gonna be pretty seamless to the user. They don't see this port number or this local host or maybe even an IP address. It's kind of masked away for them. But this is needed because we're right here, particularly we're running in a Mac OS X environment, but we might be doing it some in some other environment or even directly on Linux. And there may not even be a port number in that case. It's just going to depend on where you're running your virtual machine. If you're using one at all, or if you're just on Linux directly as to what this particular URL is going to look like. So for us, we're going through virtual box. So, the port numbers map from Linux through VirtualBox to Mac OS X. Then if we want, we can expose them off of Mac OS X to someone else. So that's a little bit more involved scenario than if we're just running it directly from Linux, which is a little bit easier. So let's look at a few of the other commands that we've been using. This one here, the Docker PS-A command, allows us to see the running containers. And we can see their IDs, what their names are, we can see the amount of memory they're using. We can see when they were created. There's a whole list of them. And remember, like for the Hello World, you may see multiple containers because we supplied, we ran it multiple times. We supplied it different parameters when we ran it. So we might even have 
multiple of the same kind of container running and it will display maybe different names depending on what we fed it. Then we use very often as well this Docker RM, which is a remove. So we put in the container ID and removed it. And that's what that one does. We also had the RMI where we actually remove the image. So you have the container in memory running. You might want to remove. Then you can do the RMI for the actual image. But if you want to do the image, you need to remove any containers that are running as well. So they remove the container. Now you can remove the image. Then on our web server. So we did a few things with the web server and particularly an Nginx web server. And this went something like this. We had a fairly long command that we used. And in this command, we see there's some familiar things here. We have Docker runs. We know we're about to spin up a container. And if we break down this command line, this is what it looks like. So this D, this dash D, will keep it running in the background. And then the dash P, which is case sensitive, so we do need this capital P. This is going to expose the container ports to the local host, which is very important for us since we're going through this virtual box and we're on a Mac or a Windows machine. Next, we have assign the name, a container name. And these two dashes here are actually, there's no space in between them. Um, this is just um, an artifact of the slide presentation that I'm using here. It's, it wants to make it one solid line, but there's actually two dashes name or whatever the name is. So there's actually two dashes followed by the word name and there's no space in between the dashes. So kind of ignore the fact that I have a space in between these two. So you have dash dash name. That's going to then set up where you need to pass in a parameter for whatever this container name is going to be. In this case, we just call it web. So we keep it very simple. We put our Nginx instance or the container it's running in inside of a container called web. So Nginx is the program to run. This is going to be the web server that we're spinning up. So that was just kind of a blank web server whenever we hit the browser we could see the Nginx kind of info page or startup page and that just gave us some default information to let us know it's actually running. So that was all good and well. Then we wanted to create our own web page inside of the web server. That command line built on what we was using before and was quite long. So this is what it looked like. And actually this is only part of it because it went a bit more than this. So we do know what the docker run dash d dash p are. Now we have some new things going on here. We've got this dash v. We've got these paths that are being fed to it. Then we also had the second piece that we ran on a different line which we saw from the previous slide. Now again these two dashes with name is actually there's no space in between the dashes. It's just dash dash name. So how did this work? Let's break it down again. So the dash V is to mount the volume. So the volume we're mounting, we've supplied here. This is this whole path that we've put in. So my site is a directory we created. We created the my site directory. We switched into it with the CD my site. And then we created this HTML file, which was our index.html. So Nginx saw that and it used it as the default web page. So if you just hit the URL that we were given and you also added the correct port number which we saw as well how to get for port 80 then our default web page came up. It was a very simple page there was just one line in it. Inside of our volume mount we add this user share nginx html path and that's going to then mount this entire volume. We also have a space slash. We've got this backslash that's trailing all of this line here. This just allows for continuation of the command so the command is not complete. And if you remember, we add this slash, we hit enter, we didn't get a dollar sign docker. What we got was like a sideways caret or a bracket um, pointing towards the right. 
So it was a different command prompt that we got that basically means continue with your command. And at that point, we typed in dash dash name web nginx. We just finished off the command that was remaining there. And you didn't have to do it that way. You could not include the slash and just keep going with dash dash name space web space nginx all on one line that would have the same end result. But as it gets longer and longer, it's easier to see it if you break it apart in multiple lines because then you don't have to do the horizontal scrolling to see everything that's going on. So just something to keep in mind when you're executing these, if you ever need to break it apart, do a space, a backslash, hit enter, and you can continue whatever the command is that you're working with. And continuing with web server commands, there were a few more we used to get some useful information. So we had Docker port, and that gave back the particular port numbers that were running our web server. So we had two, we had 443, I believe it was, and we had our port 80. So to access the website, we needed the port 80, and that gave us a five digit port number. In this case, it was five digits, so in your machine it might be different. Then we also stopped and restarted the web server or destroyed it and recreated it. That also gave us different port numbers, so every time you stop it, restart it, or destroy it, recreate it, just remember you'll get a different port number. And you saw in one case where I copied the bottom port number, I believe, just by instinct because it seemed to always port 80 appear below the port 443. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes the port 80 is above the 443. So just something to keep in mind there as you're working with these. Be aware that they can flip and one's on top, whereas before it may have been on the bottom. We also co executed a command called Docker Machine and we supplied the parameters of IP and then default, and that gave us the IP address. And then that was everything you needed to access your web server. So you just put in the IP address, colon, whatever the port number is for port 80. And then that will give you your web server and your index.html page will display at that point. And here's the command for stopping the web server. So just issue a docker stop followed by whatever the container name is in our case it was called web and we can do the same with a docker start so docker start web and that will start up the web server and again you'll have to get the new port numbers when you want to access that web page so one other thing in here that i also did as we were going through these lessons i left in the various issues that i ran into so that you could see those as well. You could see the errors. You could see what I did to work through them because these might be errors you're gonna run into as well. It's not always gonna go perfect because I guess one reason is the command line. So you, it's maybe a little bit more tedious. Sometimes it can be a little more difficult to see where you are because you're just working off the command line. So I left the errors in that we could work through together and see how to reach a resolution on those and get to where the endpoint we wanted to reach. So that is a look at how to create web servers in containers with Docker.